All right, so I asked you to read for today uh, Arnhardt's introduction to his book, Political Questions, and um, also to watch a video on Plato's Republic, so hopefully uh, those will kind of get you going. Hope you enjoy the video, and we'll, we'll talk about that hopefully before the class is over. Um, but I wanted to start out with what Arnhardt uh, had to say. Uh, as I think I mentioned last time, he actually was my dissertation director. I know him quite well, and his mind is a little bit quirky. Uh, he thinks in a unique way. And uh, I think he started out his education in American political thought. And that still shows up, even though he went into, he actually went into something called biopolitics and has spent a lot of his career on the application of biology to political thought. So he starts off, predictably, from my point of view, with some observations about the American regime, about the Declaration of Independence. And I think that he does this not only because he's very familiar with it, but also because he's thinking that his readers are going to be more familiar with it. It's a sort of entry into political thought that he, uh, that he does there, where he basically establishes the controversial idea, actually, that political thought should be taken seriously, that the ideas of thinkers like the founders ought to be taken seriously, that they're not just mere rhetoric, that they're not, in other words, just you know, for show, uh, but that the ideas matter. Um, and that's not, I say it's controversial because certainly not everybody agrees with that. Okay? Um, and some people think that beneath the words, what, what you will find is power relationships, for instance. And the, the power uh, and who has it matters more than the words. Okay? But if you're going to be a student of political thought, Arnhardt thinks you need to take those words and arguments seriously. Um, and I highlighted or arrowed up the laws of nature there because he makes a point about when the Declaration uh, speaks of the laws of nature, it's making a claim that you can see in nature um, certain rules that if you, if, if you follow them lead to peace and happiness and if you don't, lead to chaos and unhappiness. Okay? Uh, whether we're talking about Aquinas' view of, of natural law, which is much more expansive than the founders' view, um, or we're talking about the type embraced by the American founders, that's still the same. It's, it still applies. Okay? Um, that you can find in nature certain rules. Okay? You can discover them. And that means that they're permanent, that they're real and permanent and that you can discover them, and then it's your choice, of course, whether you live by those rules or not. Now, um, what nature, you know, I've just used that term nature, and the Declaration uses the term laws of nature. What does nature mean here? I mean, what nature do you think they're talking about? They're talking about the natural world? Are we going out and looking at lakes and streams and forests and the animal kingdom? Yeah. Universal law. Okay, of what? Of the universe, like, um, like objective. For example, he uses rights mm -hmm. as an example that, that uh, to say we have rights is to assume that there's an objective right. Mm -hmm. So it's, therefore, um, he, when we claim that in the Declaration of Independence or anything, they were saying that there's right there. Mm -hmm. That's objective. Right. right, objective right. That's They still um, believed in that and proclaim that in the Declaration of Independence. It is a controversial idea, uh, of course, as you know, as to whether you can even have objective right or know what, what, that, what right is. Is that a universal thing, or is it just sort of something that is uh, relative to time and place and culture and so forth? Um, he's talking about human nature, right, not just, just the universe. He's talking about human nature. So basically, the, the Declaration is saying we can know something permanently true about human nature. Okay? Um, and so, at least to start out with, Arnhardt wants people to entertain that possibility. Because if we can't possibly know anything permanently true about human nature, there isn't a whole lot of point in doing political philosophy. Okay? There's a point in doing a lot of other things, a lot of studies, but political philosophy kind of hinges upon the hope, anyway that you can do that, okay? And then Arnhardt does something 
in this chapter that's useful for us today for trying to figure out what is the difference really between what we're going to be studying in this class and what you're probably more familiar with, like the thought of the founders, the modern political thought. On page five, he says, comparing Aristotle and John Locke. Locke was a 17th century uh, political thinker who's you know, one of the fathers of classical liberalism and an inspiration to the American founders. In the middle of page five, he says, Aristotle and Locke would agree that government should promote those conditions necessary for human beings to fulfill their humanity. But Locke, according to some interpreters, would think that it is sufficient for government to secure peace by prohibiting physical injuries among humans and leaving them free to live as they please without shaping their moral character according to any standard of the common good. Okay, kind of a long sentence, but in other words, Locke thought that it was enough for government to keep the peace. The main objective was to keep the peace and figure out what kind of government uh, did that. And there were certain natural rights that you had, but they were pretty simple. Okay, you have a right to self-preservation. You have a right, in other words, to have not have your property or your life taken from you, you know, violently or even not violently without your consent. And the government needs to enforce those rights and protect them for you and then you are free to live your life as you choose within that context. So he says, Aristotle, on the other hand, would insist that government should provide the conditions not only for living, but also for living well. In the pursuit of happiness, Aristotle believes human beings seek to fulfill their natural potential, of which the capacity for reasoning is the highest, being that which is most distinctive of the human species, and the perfection of reason is possible only through sharing in a common culture. Okay? That's quite different. Okay? Um, on the one hand, you have government protecting you and, and helping you to preserve your rights so that you can choose what life to live. You make your own choices. You know, Do I want to believe in God or don't I, for instance? If I do want to believe in God, which church or synagogue or other house of worship do I want to attend, if any? Okay. Do I want to say anything about my beliefs or not? Those are, that's my business. Okay. Um, how do I want to live my life otherwise? Okay. Do I want to have a family or not? Okay. Uh, you know, what kind of morality shall I teach my children if I do have a family? That's up to me. Okay. On the other hand, the ancients thought we should not leave that much up to choice, individual choice. Okay. So what he's saying about Aristotle there is that Aristotle thought government was for more than just protecting people from themselves and the external enemies, but it was for helping people to live the good life as defined by, not themselves, but by somebody wiser than themselves, okay? Either a, a philosopher, a wise man, or, in the case of the medievals, that will be studying religious authority, okay? With the idea that not everybody is equally qualified to make that determination, okay? So there's a big difference between the, the typical ancient perspective on this question and the modern. And the reason why Locke and other modern thinkers take this turn away from government being so wanting to be active in our lives, defining the good life for us, uh, you know, in sort of enforcing a common culture, is because in Europe there had been so many wars and so many conflicts and, and uh, violence committed over especially religious differences that they decided that there was no solution other for government to sort of step back okay, and allow people to make those decisions for themselves and to, and to promote tolerance. So in effect, they ceded ground that the ancients wouldn't have ceded and said, you know what, the only way to keep peace is for government to not try to tell people what is the good life or to try to save their soul, to use the, the, uh, the Christian perspective, okay? So let's think for a moment about these questions. First of all, what's the problem with the ancient position, if there is a problem with it? What could be a problem with 
but basically saying, you know, we somebody else knows how best you should live your life. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess human nature would get in the way mostly. Like, you know, if like you're trying to have government try to tell people how to live, well, you know, just some things like um, just being. I don't know if you call it selfish or thinking about your own position. That's just kind of like a human thing to mm -hmm. kind of think about yourself before you think about others. And that's not something that the government can really take away or stop people from experiencing. Like, you can't just control everyone's, you know, feelings or their pain. Like, you can kind of guide them, but you can't really stop their innate human nature mm -hmm. all the time. So this kind of goes against what you see as human nature, right? It, it contradicts our tendency to want to be uh, selfish, to think about our individual, to think that our individual judgment is superior. Isn't that kind of a common attitude that a lot of human beings have? To think of themselves first and so forth. So you're saying, how could the ancient strategy really work? Isn't it sort of doomed to failure, you know, because people just don't want to conform to that, okay? And I think what you'll find is that, you know, this may not be the greatest answer to that concern, but uh, they did know that. They did, they did, they were fully aware that most of the time human beings would not be able to conform to these standards. They still thought it was a good idea to try, but they, they were pretty aware of the flawed nature of human beings, okay? Does anybody else see any other problem with the ancient position? Uh -huh. uh, who's the person that sets these standards mm -hmm. by which everybody's going to live? Like, yeah. who's the wise man? Right, very well put. Who's the wise man? Well, you know, that was a question that modern philosophers asked. The modern liberal philosophers in particular, they asked that question. Many people claim to be wise. You know, but what if you get the wrong one? What if you get somebody who really isn't wise but is truly selfish themselves or just misguided and they lead people down the wrong path? Do we really want one or a few people making decisions when they may not be the wise? And you know, how, how, how do we select that or do we? You know, how can we select the wise? Again, Plato understood that issue and it's a pretty difficult problem, okay? Um, and I'm not sure he has the greatest answer to it. The, the modern uh, thinkers said, you know, we really can't. You know, most of the time, the people who claim to be wise are not wise. They're, they're flawed. And especially when they get into power, even if they had some wisdom, they tend to lose it because the power corrupts them. So they said, well, we can't, therefore, we can't have a government that relies on wisdom. We have to structure it so that even, it can work even if we have very flawed human beings in charge of it, okay? What we see in the Republic is Plato will say, um, he'll give you a picture of what most government is like, especially democratic government, with this ship of state um, analogy that he makes. And most government is run by unwise people who are ambitious. But yet, he says, wouldn't it run better if we truly could give power to the one that we know is wise, but we refuse to cede our authority to that person. Okay. So he's trying to teach people something, but whether it would work in practice, he, he himself doubts. Which leads to the question, what is he really doing then? Okay. We'll, we'll have to try to figure that out. Any problem that you can see with a modern position of sort of pulling back? Uh -huh. I think it just, I think every, like so many decisions that a government can make has a, like, is a value, is based on a value. I think that like people desire value, like values and desire, I don't know if the word would be morality and decision. I think the problem with saying that like a government can't do anything outside of like 100% um, objectivity is it, it couldn't do anything, I feel like. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so I think, I, I don't know, yeah, I think their government, whether you want to not, will make a uh, moral decision and what it does and a lot of times, so yeah. Okay. So what I hear you saying is that morality is always a part of the decision-making process, and if you ignore that, you don't talk about it openly, you get a poor outcome, yeah, right? Or you don't do anything, like there is no government. Like they just say, we won't deal with this because we don't want to move into controversial waters. Yeah, 
Mm -hmm. With no set standard what's right or wrong, where does the government decide to exercise their power, I guess? Yeah, good question. Where where do they where would that come from if there's no set standard of right and wrong? <clears throat> Something like our constitution? Yes, which basically extols majority rule, right? I mean, other than the natural rights, the rights that are embodied in the Bill of Rights, for instance, which we consider permanent, although because of political change over time, we may interpret those slightly differently, right, through the Supreme Court, through who is appointed to the Supreme Court. Um, but in a modern government such as ours, a lot of those decisions are made by majority rule, which means they fall back on the, on the people to make those decisions. Um, if you take away the power from the elites to majority rule, it's possible to have unqualified people in power. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. And this is a big problem that, that Plato recognizes. And you know, he's, he's very good at critiquing uh, democratic governance. You know, a lot of times we unfortunately put unqualified people in power. Okay. Um, and whereas he says we need to have very highly qualified people in power who can kind of lead us, you know, guide us in the right direction because people don't always make the best decisions on their own. Yeah. So this does have the problem of it steps back far enough from moral decision making that it may leave people <coughs> so much on their own that they, that they make poor choices and you have basically some moral chaos. Um, and whether there's any in between, who knows? Uh, Plato thought that, that ultimately the best government was that which was led by the best people. So even if you had a democracy, it was better for, the, for a democracy to be led by the true statesman, the, the person who's actually concerned about the common good and not their own political future. It's just that it's pretty rare. Um, however, we might be able to recognize such a person if we, if we could uh, find one. All right, so what we're going to be looking at in this class is primarily uh, the ancient position. And, and the medieval uh, position is, is similar, very similar in that big regard, which is that you know, certainly medieval thinkers thought that it was for the authority to decide. You know. Uh, in their case, the authority reformed by, uh, informed by Christianity. Okay. Um, so all of the thinkers that we're going to study in this class are informed by that older view. And the reason for having this discussion is because you need to really kind of fathom how different that is from the way that we think now. It's really a challenge to the way we think. And when you think about it, um, and I'm not... Uh, yeah, I'm not getting into whether there's a any sort of truth to this position or not. But when you think about it, the clash between the West and the Middle East is somewhat about this question because for a, from a lot of their perspectives, they can't understand why the Westerners have stepped back from taking any sort of authority in the area of religion or how people should live their lives. You know, from their perspective, that's what government is still for. Okay? So, the clash between those two civilizations is kind of embodied by this difference in a way. Okay. So the ancients thought that government should promote virtue, the good life, right? That you couldn't be happy unless you could, or you, the happier you would be, the more you would conform to uh, the virtuous life. Okay. And if the further that you fell away from virtue, the less happy you'd be. Many of you took um, the intro to political thought class, so you're somewhat familiar with that argument, where Socrates shows that you know, if you start thinking about your own selfish interests and you want power and so forth, you get on this nasty treadmill, pretty soon you're a slave, or slave to your passions, and that makes you actually miserable. And he's confronting a culture that thinks that that is the, the definition of happiness. Okay. Um, so that's his perspective, but not necessarily shared by everybody in his own time. Okay. Um, so it is not to be defined by the individual or the majority, which is the way we see it now, but by the wise or by religious authority. It's interesting. Socrates was not too much into religious authority. I mean, he, put, he bowed to it when he needed to. 
Um, but, uh, but he thought that a lot of religious authority and authority of this time was sort of based on unthinking prejudice. Okay? And what I mean by that is that people grew up learning about the gods and so forth and you know, how to sacrifice to them and the idea that if you sacrifice to them, you'd get off from whatever sins you committed. And, and that there really wasn't a lot of moral guidance coming through um, their religion from his perspective, and therefore he wasn't all that happy with it all the time. Okay? So for him, authority should come from human reason, and actually religion should conform to that. All right, so I wrote down three different characteristics of ancient political thought just to kind of get you thinking about it and maybe appreciating it a little bit. Um, first of all, it's refreshing in that these thinkers that, we, that we'll be studying, uh, uh, Aristotle as well as Plato, and even um, Augustine, okay, um, spoke in very plain terms about real life issues, issues that, that everybody could understand. Okay? And it may be a little hard to get used to the dialogue, but you'll find that all of these people are real people. Uh, they talk about things very plainly. They use um, examples that are from real life. They don't use a lot of um, complicated, abstract jargon. And if you've ever read modern, especially postmodern <laughs> philosophy, you know how different that is. Okay? And yet some of the most profound and timeless thoughts have come through from these thinkers that we still uh, can use today, that we still can um, can grapple with today. So that's kind of nice, um, that they don't use esoteric, abstract language. They're not trying to. Lots of times, I think, modern authors almost try to impress you with their intelligence by being obscure. OK, you know what I mean? There's really nothing about being obscure that actually speaks of intelligence. All right. They're confident. What I mean by that is it's kind of nice to see, at least for a time, people who believe that human beings can reason and reason well, okay, and that through using reason, they can actually discern, if not pure right and wrong, which many of them thought, but at least better or worse, okay? that they could figure out which is the better law, or which is the better government, or which is the better way of life, based on, on standards that they could arrive at through reason. And also, they're modest, in that you'll find, though you may be a little frustrated by it, that they understand their limits, that they understand that they're dealing with a very difficult world, that people don't want to agree with what they have to say, that they are probably not going to be in charge that whether you've got dictatorship or democracy, which were the two most likely systems in their day, um, you probably aren't going to have the wise actually ruling. You probably aren't going to have the best laws. And what do you do with that? Okay. But they're pretty realistic. And you'll find in the Republic that, that Socrates gives several reasons why his own ideal city will probably never come to pass. Okay. So at least they're not making grandiose statements about, such as the Enlightenment philosophers did, about the power of human reason to absolutely and completely change the world. Or like the Marxists did later on, overturning everything and starting a brand new world. And uh, you know, looking back at, at political history is kind of nice sometimes to see an intellectual willing to admit he can't change the entire world. All right. There's some of the dates, by the way, for Socrates and Plato. Um, and Socrates lived to be 70 years old. Um, Plato lived to be in his early 80s. Which, but both of those are just incredible for the time. I think the typical life expectancy for somebody at this time was probably late 30s or early 40s. Okay, and uh, you know the reason for that was that um, they'd get killed by disease or by war. 
And um, so, you know, and, and Socrates actually served in the in the army and was put in harm's way when he was young. So, but he got through that and he managed to thrive. So interesting. They're very old, both of them. Um, Socrates is not an author. Okay. So nowhere have we been able to find anything that he wrote. So the only way we know Socrates is through Plato and a couple of other authors okay, who write about him, either in the case of Aristophanes making fun of him or in the case of Xenophon trying to um, communicate what he thought like Plato did, but um, we don't know him directly. Okay? And that's kind of characteristic of, of him. And you know, we understand him as somebody who's was very social, somebody who thought that, that life was all about getting out there and talking to people. He spent his whole adult life talking to people, one person at a time, okay? Getting together in groups, but engaging most of the time, one person at a time, okay? And you might ask yourself, well, why didn't he think his ideas were important enough to write down? Well, the model at this time was to develop disciples, you know, to sort of spread the word through other people and not to lay down some sort of um, holy writ okay, that had to be um, obeyed or agreed with or not. And even when Plato wrote this stuff down, you'll notice he wrote it down in dialogue form, which opens up, instead of writing something basically and saying, this is it, this is what I think, agree with it or not, left it open for people to have contrary thoughts and contrary ideas and to, and to uh, agree or disagree with parts of the argument, okay, rather than having to accept or reject everything. Okay. Socrates challenged popular beliefs in in democratic Athens, such as what was the greatest good for individuals in the city? What were the typical Athenian, based on what you know if you took that intro class, what would the typical Athenian think was the greatest good for the individual and for the city? What would most people be aiming at, especially the men? Because women, women at this time were not really active in citizenship. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't they try to be like successful and try to make like make as much money as possible? Like money that? making would have been big, yes. Making money. There's something even bigger than that, and they kind of go together in a way. But definitely being rich, and the city being rich would have been and was very very important. Okay. Anything else? Uh huh. Just all about continuous learning. Okay. Well, that's what Plato and Socrates thought. And some other people would have agreed with them, but probably not the, the majority. We're talking about the majority now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Would it be their vote in the political process? OK, democracy itself. OK, definitely. They very much admired that. So being a democratic citizen, which means, I mean, really, they thought it's not enough to just sort of have an opinion or show up every once in a while. To be a really good, admirable, democratic citizen, you had to be there every time. You had to go to that assembly. You had to take leadership. You had to try to persuade others. And the pinnacle was, of course, to become a politician and a very prominent one, somebody who could really you know, sway people's views. So that rhetor rhetorician, the life of the rhetorician and the democratic politician was very much admired. And then the one that we're missing is the military life, okay? Military glory. And actually, a lot of Athenian leaders got to their political power and their wealth first by demonstrating that they could achieve great things on the battlefield. You know, the figure of Achilles was, you know, this, the mythical um, ideal for these people, okay? And if they could prove themselves on the battlefield through heroics and they could rise up the ranks in the military and maybe become a general, the general could then run for office and be much more admired and much more likely to be successful because of that past military experience. Okay? So it all went together. And of course, success leads to wealth okay, in this system. 
All right. Well, we know that Socrates didn't think, he, he didn't mind uh, defending the country, that's not a problem, he wasn't a pacifist, uh, but he didn't think that glory or wealth were the top achievements, and he did think that a lot of Athenian leaders spent too much time pursuing those things, and those were selfish things, okay, from his perspective, where they thought about, you know, their own good and not the common good. Okay? So he would juxtapose, okay, he would oppose, in other words, this ideal of the rich, um, you know, guy with a military past, uh, with a great reputation and politically powerful with the philosopher leader, you know, somebody who takes control because people recognize his authority, his wisdom, and so forth, and he rules for the common good, not in the pursuit of self-interest. What were the gods like for most Athenians? How did they think of them? Anybody study Greek mythology at all? Uh -huh. They weren't necessarily benevolent. Uh, they were kind of just like regular people, just happened to have more powers. Yeah, yeah, very well said. Yes, they were like the rest of us. In fact, it's almost so popular like their lives, you know. They did many bad things to each other and to human beings, um, and human beings just had to respect them because of their power. And people explain the events of life through this or that god quarreling with another, um, Olympus battling, you know, over this or that issue, um, manipulating human affairs as part of their competitions and so forth. So the Greek gods, as most people believe them, they, they believed in their power and they would sacrifice to them and pray to them because they were fearful of their power and they wanted things to turn out well in their lives. But they weren't really role models, per se. You know? <laughs> they knew that the gods, or they thought that the gods wanted them to be law-abiding and good, but they, they themselves didn't have to be because they were gods. Okay? Socrates and Plato really objected to that view. Okay? And what we find in some of the Platonic dialogues is some questioning as to whether that's even true or not. Okay? doesn't really happen in the Republic very much, but there's some questioning in other dialogues about maybe we should think of God. Is, can you have a real God who isn't better than human beings, I guess would be a, a good way to put it. Okay. If God is real, and I'm using the single you know, on purpose because Plato reasoned that probably there's just one. Okay. The mover, the creator of the universe. Everything stems from an original source. Okay? And if there is a God, then it has to be superior to human beings. So we, we can't believe that the God acts like the worst of human beings. Okay? So he's got to have much more you know, in the way of knowledge, in the way of character. In fact, he, had, he would have to be the source of justice and virtue and morality. Okay? And so he very much does object um, to that popular view. We've already talked about this one, what a good leader would be like, would, would not be the typical Athenian view. What would be the proper role of the intellectual from the typical Athenian perspective? What should the intellectual do? Somebody like Socrates. Is his job to rule over people and tell them what to do? No, they didn't like that. That was very arrogant, right? very undemocratic. You know, they were very, very proud of their of their developed democracy. Right? So the idea of a philosopher coming along and saying, "I know better than you. Just give me the power, and I'll tell you what to do," that did not go over very well. So probably they thought of the intellectual as their servant, right? Somebody who could teach their children. You know, somebody who could give service when service is requested. You know, oh, we have this problem. Please analyze this for us and give us a report, okay? But we will decide what to do with that information. You need to keep your place, okay? So, the, so I suspect that they thought the proper role of the intellectual was as a sort of public servant, okay? Somewhat like the many intellectuals we have today who work for our think tanks or work for government. You know, they. If I work for government, I'm going to be giving my opinion, but I can't expect my opinion to be, uh, to be obeyed. Okay? 
All right, obviously Socrates disagreed with that. He did realize that was the typical state of affairs, though. All right. Socrates' method, he calls himself a gadfly, which is like a, a pesky horsefly. If you've ever, you know, been out uh, camping or something like that, and these big buzzing flies come around, they bang you on the head, and they bother the hell out of you until you can kill them. That's kind of um, how Socrates viewed himself. You know, his function was to, he said, sting people continually. So he knew he was kind of unpleasant, and he asked uncomfortable questions, and he made points that people didn't like. Okay? But he thought it was his duty to do that. And uh, so he would openly deconstruct and take apart the popular ideas, the orthodoxies of his day. So he was like Mr. Counterculture, basically. Okay? And he knew, I think, that it would eventually catch up to him. You know, you can't be that in America, let's put it this way, in America, okay, if you had a prominent intellectual who constantly said bad things about the democratic system, okay, not just bad things about this or that leader or the Supreme Court justices or something like that, but actually came right out and said bad things about the democratic system and that it ought to be replaced with something better, how do you think such a person would be viewed? How is such a person viewed? Oh, well. No, not well. Like public enemy number one, right? Because, as Arnhardt points out, even in a democratic system, certain things shouldn't be questioned. At least that's what most people think. Certain basic values of that regime, it's very dangerous to question. Okay? So he did that, and he understood that that was risky, um, and suggesting better choices. He thought talking to people was superior to writing. We've also discussed that, but uh, there's more than one way to influence people. You remember learning about uh, Confucius as well. He did the same thing. Okay? Primarily spoke to people and gathered disciples. And it's not a bad strategy in hindsight. The Socratic method that you've heard about is this. It's asking questions and leading the argument through these critical questions. Rather than giving people answers, you ask questions. It's not at all easy to do, and most teachers who say they're doing it don't do it, and I don't even do it most of the time. Okay? It takes an awful lot of brain power to actually lead an argument through critical questions. So, but that's what he did. Some of his characteristics, one really neat one is his intimacy with his friends. Friendships were hugely important to Socrates. Plato's student Aristotle actually wrote a great deal on friendship, and I think it comes from this original position of Socrates, that really the happiest moments of life are when you are conversing with your friends. And many of his friends were members of the upper class, even though he himself was not actually born into the upper class. Um, and some of them were parts of the aristocratic party in Athens that didn't like the complete and unfettered democracy. One of them that I think is mentioned in the Republic is Alcibiades. You learned a little about him in the other class. Um, but Alcibiades was a, a great general. He gained a lot of political power at a certain point in his career. But at the same time, he was not the greatest fan of Athenian democracy. He would have preferred aristocratic rule. And he tried to do so through getting the Persians to support him at one point, trying to flirt with the Spartans at another point. And as the Socrates being associated with certain friends was partly what got him into trouble. Okay? To be associated with men like Alcibiades. And by the way, and you'll find some references to this in the, in the Republic, Socrates had a certain more than platonic relationship with Alcibiades. Well, maybe no, I'll take that back. It was, it was not a sexual relationship, according to him. However, it was more than a friendship. Okay. 
Alcibiades, um, in another dialogue, is shown to be pleading with Socrates to make it a full relationship. And at this time, um, this type of relationship was not uncommon. Okay? And, Al and Socrates' response to Alcibiades is, you know what, sexual relationship is not nearly as important as the relationship that we have with each other intellectually, therefore I prefer to stay at this level. But I love you, basically. Okay? And um, that's why we use the term platonic relationship. All right, so you will run into a little bit of that, especially in book five, when they start to deal with what should, what type of relationship should the rulers be privy to, okay? Well, they should have the best of women, but they should also be able to have the best of the young men, okay? So don't let that surprise you. It's a different, it's a sort of cultural difference, you might say. And why? Because women at this time, like Xanthropy, his wife, were just really not well equipped to have a full relationship with their husbands. Okay? They were to raise the children. They didn't get much of an education. They couldn't be partners in that sense. So men spent a lot of time with each other. Some authors have actually said the Greek culture was misogynist because of this. They preferred each other because their wives and their girlfriends were not good partners for them. All right, so intimacy with friends was his life. Also, he had something he called a diamond or spirit um, that, that we don't know what he meant by that, really, but something within him that would warn him away, that was not purely just rational, that would warn him away from bad ideas and bad actions. It was almost like he had a certain type of intuition that told him what not to do. And he wasn't completely cerebral, I guess you might say. And he said that the oracle at Delphi, which was a, a prophetess, had told him that he was the wisest man in the world. And he said that he spent a lot of the rest of his life trying to prove or disprove that prophecy. Right? And that his demon was a part of, of that, of sort of prodding him on. To, to try to prove or disprove that. Socrates' response to the oracle was, if I am the wisest, it is only because I know that I don't know anything with absolute certainty, in other words. Although he certainly sounds like he does from time to time. Another attribute of Socrates is he's definitely, though despite the demon, uh, a believer in the great power of human reason to the point where he says these things which are not easy to agree with and even Plato's student Aristotle was not able to agree with this that really knowledge is the key to virtue that if you have true knowledge you will be good you will have no choice but to be good true knowledge changes you permanently okay and that vice, which is the harder part to get, okay, vice is the cause is caused by ignorance. If we flip that around, that means that you're saying that the only that the ignorant person isn't fully culpable in a way of the crimes that they do or the wrongs that they do because they just don't know better. Okay, can you see why this might be objected to by some people? I mean, if you say, well, that guy, you know, he got, uh, he got drunk and he raped a woman, but, but you know, he, he's not well-educated and he doesn't really, um, you know, he's really never thought things through, he's kind of ignorant. So unless he was fully educated and educated about morality as well and about self-control and so forth, we couldn't expect him to, um, to actually behave well. Kind of, you know, a little bit of a problem for us, isn't it? Is ignorance the cause of vice? Because the implication is if we learn enough, then we will not be. It contradicts the Christian perspective, as we'll see, because Christians believe that vice is caused by our sinful nature. Okay? And the, and the Christian thinker would say, well, no matter how much you know, if you become a great philosopher, you can still 
commit sin because sin is about being tempted, you know, to do wrong. It's not just about knowing enough. Some of the smartest people in the world have committed some of the greatest crimes. Okay? So this is often an insight of Socrates of Plato that's questioned. And Aristotle himself questions it. Aristotle says it's more than just knowledge that keeps us from committing vice. It's habituation. It's learning to live the right way. It's sort of internalizing um, good practices. Okay. And finally, I think I'm just about done, which is good. We believe in the forms. This will be my last piece of paper. Um, we'll see this in the Republic. Okay. Plato thought that there were certain ideas that existed eternally in perfection and could be discovered through reason. Okay. And he likened them to the mathematical act, the axioms of mathematics. Okay. And for instance, in geometry, you can have the definition of a perfect circle in your mind or a perfect straight line in your mind, and you can express it in mathematical terms, but you can't physically find one anywhere in the world in its complete perfection. Okay? That's pretty easy to take. The question is, can you say the same of moral ideas, such as the good life or justice? He thought so. He thought these two could be discovered, and that they existed in perfection to be discovered by the human mind. Okay? So that learning was really discovering, or remembering even, what we should have known or what we knew in our past life. Okay? is certainly not a matter of creation. And he said, and I just heard my dad say something like this the other day, although he didn't know he was being platonic, and he said that, um, that these ideas are more real than anything we can see around us. What we see around us is always in flux. It's always changing. It's not permanent, and therefore it is not as real as the ideas or forms. So of course, the wise person focuses on the forms and not on the fleeting, changing policies and issues of the day. 